Hello, this is Dean Radin, and I am on Your Superior Self. Hi, I'm Anita Morjani, and this is Your Superior Self. Hello, this is Dr. Raymond Moody, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, cultural creatives. I'm Bruce Lipton, and I'm here to join you with Your Superior Self. Hi, this is Paul Selig, and this is Your Superior Self. What's up, everybody? I'm Aubrey Marcus, and this is Your Superior Self. Hi, everybody. I'm Cindy Dale, and I am on Your Superior Self. I'm happy to be here. Hi, Trey. Cindy, thank you so much for joining. This is going to be an amazing time. I can tell you that already. Yeah, we're going to have some fun and we're going to talk about, you know, some of those off the wall type of topics that I think make our, uh, all of our lives better, actually. I think it does. Yeah. I think a lot, well, it shakes some people to the core, right? Their core beliefs. Um, it can make people uncomfortable, but I think in the long run, our, our goal is to uh, heal. And I think our goal is to help people realize who they truly are. Yeah. And I think that we start life that way. I mean, I remember being one of those kids that was real aware. I could just starting with some of the odd, unusual uh, topic area we might cover. I could hear ghosts. I could see colors coming off of people. I had a sense of who was ill and what might make them well, or if they were going to get well. Not that we all start with that type of openness, but I think we do all start fairly aware and awake and then life happens and we think that safety is about fitting in instead of being individuated mm. Ooh, talk, talk about that like you heard like, did you realize when you were younger that that was a ghost or did you just hear voices or what how i mean i wasn't scared of them <laughs> my my parents were <laughs> so you know i didn't think it was unusual even though i was white wonder bread you know, Lutheran living down in the South in Huntsville, Alabama. I mean, I think for all of us, if our world is a certain way, there's, you know, and we start life as narcissists, we're sort of, we assume everybody else is like us. I still have a memory of waking my parents up one night because we lived in Huntsville, Alabama. My dad worked for NASA and there was a railroad behind us. And there would be, you know, hobos. That's what we call, you know, the drifters mm -hmm. of the day, the hobos. And they would wander every so often. And I was sleeping and I could hear, I don't know what time it was, but the middle of the night, I heard the kitchen door open. I know I did. I heard hobos come in. They chit chatted. They talked. I could hear them make breakfast because I knew what the sizzling of bacon was like. And they chatted again. They left the door slammed. And my first thought as a kid, I may be four and a half or five years old or so was my mom's going to be really mad because they didn't do the dishes. And I knew you're supposed to do the dishes <laughs> when <laughs> you cooked. So I woke my parents up and my mother just rolled over and said, you're just making things up again. My dad got up rather patiently, took me to the kitchen. There's no you know, dirty dishes there. And he goes, you just, you just have an active imagination. So I, I still believed myself more than my parents. I just eventually learned not to talk about certain things with other people. Well, when did it start? Like, I mean, did you ever develop like knowledge from these voices or these entities that you ever like growing up? Did it ever stop and then start again? That's a great question. Uh, there was one really interesting evening when I saw a being show up in my dream, but it was what we call a lucid dream. It was really interactive and real. And it gave me this book. I remember the, the book. It was called The Book of All Knowledge. And I read through it. And the next morning I woke up and I think I'm still trying to grasp those sentences again, like you, you know, all of it, and then it slips away and then life becomes the dream. I was really intuitive, really psychic, really intuitive until I was about 12 or 13. And I came from probably, unfortunately, a fairly typical background, alcoholic parents, abuse, uh, you know, lots of trauma, just, I, I just didn't like it. I, I was clear. I told my parents, I'm done. One night, I just said, I'm done. I'm, I'm going to die. And of course, they looked at me like I'm <laughs> pretty crazy. 
and I got really sick. I must have lost at least 20 pounds within two to three days because I was done. I, that was the level of despondency that I had. And one of the nights, my uncle, who was a surgeon, had come over and looked at me and nobody knew what to do. And we'll have to put her in the hospital tomorrow or whatever. So that night, I knew that I was on a short leash and that if I was going to get away, I'd better do it soon or they would drag me back down into this life. So I just started leaving my body. And I remember perched at the top of the ceiling, looking down at this very thin, you know, young girl and the orange juice that had bubbles of Lysol on it. I mean, I don't know if your mother did that. I'm a different generation. Every time we got sick, we just sprayed the entire house with Lysol. And I, to this day, I've never drunk orange juice again. <laughs> and I left, I went out into the great beyond. I never saw light. I didn't get the great white, you know, kind of light greeting me. I had a voice just say, go back. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm not going back. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. And the voice again just said, no, go back. And I said, no, I don't know how long that went on. I'm kind of waiting to be really free from everything. And the voice finally said, I'm, I don't think it said shoving. I think I just felt it shoving me. Like you're going back. You haven't done anything, hmm. which I really didn't care about. I was so mad. I wonder how many of us get that sort of spiritual anger. Like this world isn't quite right. You know, I haven't been treated well. I'm not getting what I need. So I'm just going to punish who? The world, <laughs> right? God. And so I shut down my gifts. I just shut them down. I wouldn't look at anything. I wouldn't hear anything. And I became whatever the list is, you know, that's in the insurance company's uh, paperwork now, but codependent, uh, didn't become an alcoholic. So I got, I spared myself that one, uh, you know, bulimic, anorexic, this, that, and the other thing. And my gifts did, it was horrible not to have my gifts. And I believe everybody has intuitive gifts. Maybe we're just more tuned out rather than tuned in. Uh, but I did start therapy when I was 19 or 20, I wouldn't have survived otherwise. And I had a therapist say, you know, you're not only obsessive compulsive and blah, 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 blah. You're psychic and you need to deal with it. Really? And that, a therapist said that. A therapist, a real therapist. Yeah. Like a paid, right. Mm -hmm. Goes to insurance companies, therapist. Is that kind of interesting? It is interesting. Cause it's like, hmm, very objective mindsets over there. You know, you, to say something like that, that is, uh, I like that. Well, you and I were chatting just for a brief moment before we started, you know, about how some of this energy, consciousness, intuition, meditation is becoming trendy. And I mean, I'm kind of sad to some level about that because uh, there's something about fighting your way into your abilities. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, kind of bucking the odds. And I traveled around the world to learn with shamans. And, you know, I just kind of put hard scrabbled the process together. I'm very happy that we're now doing the science of energy, the science of consciousness, the science of, you know, kind of spirit and spirituality. Uh, you know, but I, I was pretty astonished that a mental health master's level therapist even knew mm -hmm. the word psychic yeah well here like right so going off of that 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 thought of mainstream consciousness or mainstream gifts right I, I think i still think there's a large population out there that is not awakened that is not really i wouldn't even say awakened like i hate when people say i'm, I'm woke or something like that like i think there's a lot of people that the these conversations make com uncomfortable right and I think a lot of people are trying to make a dollar and I think they're just doing things because they see that there's a market for that. Right. And I think they take advantage of that. Some people say, I'm a, I'm a psychic, like you're talking about, you've done the work, you've done everything that you have to, to, you know, sharpen these tools or some people can put on Instagram, you know, handle psychic medium and then have 40, 50,000 followers. Cause they think that they can, you know, cold read someone. So <clears throat> I feel you. Um, but it's also 
goes back to your point of being intuitive. Like everybody has these gifts. You should be able to feel if someone's message is right for you or not, or you're resonating with that, right? Anytime that those red flags pop up, like I'm not talking about you have to think about it or rationalize it. I'm talking about the immediate like gut feeling of this doesn't feel right. You're probably right. Yeah. And it really does come down to like your gut sense. There, there was some research a couple decades ago where there was a comparison made between psychics, people who made their living being psychics and CEOs of successful companies. And actually the CEOs ended up being tested as more psychic or being more accurate in guessing what card was going to get pulled or not because they trusted their gut. They probably... I hope this is the case, trusted their gut a lot more than they did the newspaper, right? Or the the coverage that was out there, you know, because when you go with that core intuition, which we do all have, and you let yourself believe it. I mean, Trey, don't you think that's really the key? You've got to let yourself believe this stuff. You have to be okay with being uncomfortable if it makes you uncomfortable, because the only real way to steer your way through life, especially these days when there's a million messages coming at us constantly. There's this huge politicizing of absolutely everything. There's fear, you know, kind of knocking around. And I think people are starting to recognize that we can all absorb other people's fears. We can all absorb other people's mass consciousness ideas. We're, we're like human sponges. And I had a friend years ago say the most communicable disease is depression. I would say it's anxiety (laughs) these days. So if you're not in touch with like your own core or frame of reference, you're going to get kind of blown around or really vulnerable to whichever advertisements Facebook says you're supposed to be looking at. Mm -hmm. Well, there is definitely a quantum field out there of energy that connects us all through consciousness. Um, I am really just really tapping into that source that we all are right like that awareness and it's right under our noses i never really understood that like i try to meditate or i do meditate i've done meditation for like a year now and i thought that's what i was tapping into i had no i it wasn't it was like a it was probably my um it was probably something deep inside of me but it wasn't the awareness it wasn't that consciousness it wasn't that source um, until recently, I just started reading a book. Um, the lady who wrote the secret, um, yeah. she wrote a book called the greatest secret and basically yeah. talked about her journey and what awareness is and how to find it. Like if you, if you silence, silence your mind and imagine you don't have a body, but like you close your eyes and you can just, you sense that you are aware of everything in this room or this conversation or where you're at it's like this feeling starts taking over you. Like my heart starts like feeling very high vibration, like feelings. I don't know. It's, and she states that's you coming home. That's you going back to where you're from. That's your natural state. Like we are naturally supposed to be happy. And when we attach, um, when we attach to things in this, in this material world, when we think we are this body, when we think that we are these emotions, these thoughts, that's when we become sad. That's when we become depressed because we think we're something that we're not, we're not that at all. Like we are this awareness, like everything, everything in this room is awareness. Like it's a, you know, it's of consciousness, like the mountains, just the the ocean, like you, you and I, like people are like, (laughs) we're all one hippy dippy stuff, but it's like literally like that awareness, like it's all from one spot. It's true. It, but it's also true. I I mean, science is, starting to kind of catch up. And, you know, we'll even say 99.999% of an object or a person is just subtle energy. It's space. You know, what, what is physical Einstein said forever ago, that's just dense energy. It's just energy and it's all interconnected. And I think, you know, I, again, I think we, we, can have these oceanic experiences in life, you know, and then for some people it's hard after those because then they lose it and life can look really dull or colorless. I had an interesting experience and I think that's really awesome that you're doing this through your everyday life 
and you're able to be in source and be source while you're, you know, kind of raising kids and you're talking to people and you're in your office because it is really what we are. And that's kind of the field through which we can interconnect. And we really do interconnect with love. I, I had, I've had a few experiences like that when I was a child, my first magnificent experience like that as an adult was I was actually in Peru. I had led a group down there to work with a shaman and he gave everybody ayahuasca, uh, the sacred medicine. I didn't take any because I didn't quite trust the shaman. I thought he was kind of drunk and I, <laughs> I wasn't so sure he was going to watch over the people I brought down there. I mean, we're all dressed in white, sitting on stumps out in the middle of a jungle. Right. I mean, you know, you see it and half the people get sick and there's bugs everywhere. And I'm like, I don't know, this could be, this could be a liability issue here <laughs> with, he was tottering around and it wasn't ayahuasca. So I stayed really aware and I'm sitting there and maybe about three minutes in, I'm just taken out of my body anyway. I don't know if it was, I was just, you know, kind of tuned in. I had this moment of grace where I was taken, my soul was taken to the end of this lifetime and I died. I went through the lifetime and I died. And then I'm out wherever in space. And I'm being asked this question, like, where do you want to go next? And I'm like, you know, you know, when somebody asks you those important questions, I mean, when somebody asks me those important questions, I'm actually quite stupid. I don't really know what to say. So I could hear myself speaking to whatever. And I just said, you know, you just decide. I don't even know who I was talking to. I suppose my version of God, right? And I felt this black energy come behind me and it threw me into source. I was in source. There's nothing like it. That's what you're talking about. You're in oneness. You're still who you are. I mean, there's not like a loss of self, which I think I always feared, like not giving this up. Um, it was just love. It was happy. It was love. This voice in source source said, this is home and it's everywhere. So, I mean, mm -hmm. I was gifted this experience of dying. So again, I have this little repeat, like I'm sent back, you know, source goes, you got to go back. And I go, I don't want to. And it's like, you got to go back. So I'm taken back as I'm going back through time. The voice says, now you're going to know the future. And, you know, so many people come to people like me who have an intuitive, you know, kind of quirk or other psychics or energy readers, or they do fortune telling or whatever it is you're trying to do to get your future. And I was immediately like, no, I don't want to know it. It was so clear and gut because it's like, what's the point of that? You, you want to be in, you want to be in the body when you're in the body. So I heard, okay, well, you're only going to know some things, which is like, well, then how do you know when you're right or not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. So I land and then I'm told, oh, and by the way, you're going to go through your 10 years of darkness, which I did. Um, whatever. You know, we all have those dark moments, nights, years. 10 years peace. though, 10 years. 10 years. It was 10 bloody years. It was 10 years. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. But that's the thing too, right? It's like you, like if somebody showed, that's the thing that's, that, that's tricky because it's like, if you like people, like I do it, right? Like I want to, I want to know, like, because of, for me, it's like the fear of, of being human, right? The, that fear of I'm trying so hard for my desires. Like I really, it's not even coming from a place of ego. It is coming from a place of, I need to do this to show myself that I am of that source and that powerful within with, you know, that, that energy is within me and I need to prove it to myself because that's, that would be a game changer, not just for me, but for everyone, because I will stand on that mountain, wherever it's at. And I will scream, scream to the valleys of, I did this and I did it not from ego. I did it from a place of desire and passion and I did not quit. And I want you to know that you can do that too. Like I am, you know how Jim Carrey was like, you know, he wrote that $10 million check to himself and then signed it and put it in his wallet and carried it around. Yeah, he yeah, says, yeah. And yeah. Then people forget about that. They're like, Oh, well, it's just Jim Carrey. You know, he's going to be rich anyway. You know, he's, he's a rich guy. So like, he can't, he can't be that example. Like I am want to be that example for people. Like I have 
like everyone's story, you know, like, like I, I you can relate to me, you know, not, we might not walk the same path, but we are very similar. Yeah. Every, every normal path. people, normal, normal people. people. And then they Real look at people. Trey Downs and they say where I want to be. And they're like, this is what he did. Like he, he is telling us what to do. And I want to be that for them. And the fear is like, you know, the ego is like constantly saying, dude, you should just stop. Just be content where you're at. Just, you have a great life. I'm not saying it's not great. I'm just saying like, there is a desire that is pushing me that I need to, you know, I, I, it's something pulling me. And then there's the ego left brain saying, dude, just be comfortable where you're at. Just stay where you're at. Just ride this out and retire and blah, 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 blah. But then there's this creative side of me, like the one from source that is like, has that consciousness awareness of itself. And it's like, now it wants to create. And I have that right now. And it's like pushing yeah. me and pushing me. So my, yeah. basically what I'm trying to say is with the future, it's like, what scares me is, is our future probable, probabilistic or is it like set in stone? Is it like, is it law of attraction? Is it, you know, will power? Oh, I think it's more indifferent than law of attraction. That's just my gut sense. All right. Cause law of attraction is too much too much about, you know, kind of what we're holding inside and what we're putting out there, you know, and I think that there's a bigger frame of reference than how are our thoughts creating our reality and how is our mini consciousness creating reality? I think it's like, you know, what's the bigger consciousness calling us to be? So, I mean, first of all, I personally, from my gut sense, if you would, don't have any doubts about you, um, you know, kind of like, you know, kind of the Red Sea parting kind of as you move out there because you're relatable, people understand you, your heart's in the right place. But I also understand those fears because we all have them. All of us have them. You know, I, I'm, I don't really care that much anymore, <laughs> to be honest, where I go. People ask me, what are your goals? And I'm like, yeah, I'd really like to get rid of the mice that are in the house. They're like... <laughs> because <laughs> I got little mice hotels going on in here. <laughs> they, they eat my bread. They live in the little live traps. And, you know, some of my goals are really pretty asinine <laughs> to be honest. All right. But the, but the bigger thing, you know, is the future calls us into it. When I talk about the future, cause I've kind of become a strange, I don't know if I'd say I'm an expert about the future. I don't think anybody can be, but since that experience where I was dumped back into darkness, you know, and said, now you're going to know some of the future. I read a lot about it. I work with it. I have a lot of clients I get. So I gauge myself, like, when am I accurate? When am I not supposed to tell them something? When am I know I'm wrong? When do I know they're wrong? So my tiny little formula that's not finished, you know, is that most of the future is just, of course, possibilities. And anxiety for many of us is just that we can read all these possibilities. You know, 80% of what we focus on, probably 99% of what we focus on is negative. So we just create all this tension energetically, psychically, because we're reading all these bazillion, you know, parallel universes and possibilities. And one, you know, kind of drop is what's really going to happen. And the rest is mainly negative. And so we don't even know that we're focused on those. So we freak ourselves out. Then there's like a level that's probabilities. And that's most of what I think we tune to when we're going, I think I should be a broadcaster. I think I want to be this, or I think it'd be good to get married, or I think I want to be whatever. Okay. Right. And those are probabilities, but, but we get anxious because they're not usually set in stone. And then there's destiny points. I mean, I don't know if you felt them. I have felt them in my life. Like, like you can tell this is going to happen or this was supposed to happen. Even experiences that were so-called negative in my life. I'm like, yeah, I was, you know, this was supposed to happen. Like I even married my ex-husband and had my son Gabe because I had a dream about him the night before I met him. And I knew in the dream, I didn't like him. <laughs> I'm like, I had a therapist say, you're crazy. Like that's coming from your, your wacky self, you know, that you're doing this. And it's like, well, I just have to do this. 
I mean, you try telling your therapist, yeah, I'm going to marry this person I don't match with and I don't fit and we really don't get along. And right. I mean, some of this stuff's pretty macabre and I wouldn't suggest that you go look for those situations, you know, either, but there are destiny points. And I think we can kind of tell what those are because they live inside of us. And I personally think Trey, that's where most of our real, I have to do this dreams come from is our destiny points. Doesn't mean we can control the timing, right? Or we think we know the timing. I have a son who does college ball and had a, he got COVID in his back last year. He was high on the draft list, didn't get drafted because it threw off his mechanics. It was horrible. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible mother got PTSD, you know, too. But, um, but it's like, but that didn't change his destiny. Maybe it even made it more real because in the going through that, he worked through deeper emotional issues that creates more of a full person, right? Mm -hmm. For his whole future. So when it, when it comes to future, and I, I get that stuff for people, um, you know, I could kind of gauge this is on your path, but let's not pretend it's going to be easy. If, if, you know what I mean? We don't know, or that, you know, you know exactly how it's going to happen, but if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Yeah. I guess that's it. Right. Like, cause you, you put so much effort into it. It's just like, it's like your baby, right? Like it's your kid. Yeah. It's like your dream. It's your desire. It's like, you've put in everything into this thing. Like you have, you yeah. have basically given your soul to this thing. It is your soul. Exactly. Yeah. And then it's like, then it's just like, I don't know, but if, but I feel like when it is aligned with what you were talking about, like these destiny mm -hmm. points, it's not, it's easy going, it's free flowing. It's kind of like things start happening and you're kind of like, you know, us being here on this level of reality where everything is just so slow. And we have this, this idea yeah. what time is time and space. And it's a technology, really. It's not even really real, really. Mm -hmm. And we feel like we're just slowly going through this, this, these realities. And it's like, you have this thing and you want it, but it's like, you're not ready yeah. for it yet. Right. Like, right. I mean, I know it's a prep we're prepping. We're doing prep. <laughs> like <laughs> I had a, I had a vision 20 years ago, 30, 25 years ago that, um, there were these little books and each of them was about a chakra. And I was the author of them. Now I have written a lot of books about chakras. I just got the contract for those eight books. There's seven chakras. I do 12, blah, blah, blah. Right. But I just got the contract for what I dreamed about like a month ago. Hmm. And I told my publisher, she goes, Hey, would you want to write these books? And I wrote her back like, yeah, I dreamt about this like 20, 25 years ago, of course. So <laughs> here I'm, you know, kind of going through the stream and meandering and there it is. And I'm, like so excited because I want to see what they really are. It, sometimes we confuse destiny points also with um, probabilities because there can be super strong probabilities. And if we believe sometimes, especially negative things are a destiny point, we may not do our part either. I had a client I worked with um, several years ago and he was actually a friend and he was Fidel Castro was alive and he went down to Cuba. He was sponsored to go meet with Fidel Castro to talk about opening subway stores in Cuba. I mean, I was like, wow, that's a cool thing to go to Cuba to talk about. So he came to talk to me about it. And I saw the picture I saw was an airplane, a chartered airplane that he had, he was going to be flown down there and back in. And I saw the engines going out. And, you know, you don't want to see something like that. You certainly don't want to say that to somebody. But I told them and I said, look, I don't, I, I hope your business goes well. If it doesn't go well, I would be kind of in touch with my guides if I were you, because you could get sabotaged on the way back. Your plane could get in trouble. And um, now sometimes I don't tell people when I see bad things. Sometimes I'm like, you've got to say this, Cindy, because they got to do something with this. So he came to see me after his trip. The business didn't go well. He's coming back on the plane and one of the engines dies, dies. Then the next engine, there's two engines, starts to die. And he's like, 
well, this isn't good. <laughs> and oh. he said, he said, Cindy, I just prayed. I don't know if it matters who we pray to. You know what I mean? I'm not caught up on terms and blah, you know, all this kind of stuff. I think it's a way of spreading our own spirit, you know, out there and interconnecting with like the quantum web, the field, whatever word, you know, we use these days. It changes every decade or so. That's my experience. <laughs> And he could feel the wings. He said, I felt wings. I felt angel wings underneath the wings. And that sputtering engine started again and we were fine. Mm. So whatever is on the path, I mean, we're, we're in a co-creating position. Like you said, sometimes it's super, super frustrating because no matter what we do, we hit a wall. I mean, or we hit a door and then we got to find the doorknob, <laughs> right? Which can take a while, like for people like me who are not mechanical. Um, but, but, you know, it's, if it's going to be, it's going to be, I really believe that it's going to sure. land. Gonna and happen. sometimes just in these strange, quirky kind of, kind of, I didn't see that coming sort of ways. Mm. Does your, do your, do your boys ever ask you for things yes all right my baseball playing son does all the time because i'm really pretty accurate and i can help him work through the issues um one time he had me come for training with his coach his pitching coach and we were out there and i don't remember what he was getting you know on you know maybe I don't know, 87, 88 or something like that. Oh, and he's just, he's just throwing fire. That's all. That's 87, <laughs> 88, 90. I mean, I just... So, so he said, mom, you know, how do I get faster? And I did my mom weird mom thing. And I'm like, well, there's some ancestral issues sitting in your gut and let's move those and blah, blah, blah. And the next time he threw, it was 93. And he's going this, you know, what really works, <laughs> which, which he tends to forget every so often because I'm also just mom. Right. So He'll even call me sometimes and I'll go, but well, mom, what do you think of this? And I'll tell him, he goes, now, is that mom or is that the voice in your head? Because I really want to talk to the voice in your head. <laughs> so No, it's funny. You have to be very careful with baseball players. You, we yep. are very, very superstitious. So if you clear very. the ancestral trauma in his body, you'll probably end up doing it for the starting rotation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We have, there's so much stuff. I mean, and, and even then it's an up and down thing. And there's, I have to, most of the time say, I don't get anything work with this person, work with that. My oldest son is different though, because this stuff is sort of like, I'm, I'm, I want to be separate from it. So here's how, here's how mom uses her intuition with him and his partner of eight, nine years. A few years ago, I just was thumbing through um, a catalog, like what, what is that catalog? The one with all the fancy, expensive kitchen stuff. Um, I don't, I don't remember. Know. It's got two names. It's all fancy and it's expensive. Crate and barrel? No, <laughs> it's more expensive than that. Uh, if it's more inspection, crate and barrel, yeah. I have no it's idea. That, it's that high end stuff, which I don't even know I was looking at the catalog. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, Sonoma, Williams and Sonoma. Mm -hmm. So it's mailed to me. I'm looking through it and I'm seeing this red waffle, Brevere, whatever, Breville, whatever, red waffle maker. And I'm like, I need to buy that for them. I'm like, why would I buy them a red waffle maker? I'm like, I don't, they, they didn't grow up with, they grew up with Eggos. They don't, do they even make waffles, my boys? But I bought it and I shipped it to them. You know, my oldest son and his um, partner. And about a week later, they called me and they go, did, did you send us that red Breville waffle maker? I don't even know if I'm saying the name right. I go, yeah. They go, well, that's really weird because a couple of weeks ago we were thinking of getting it and we didn't have the money. So they gave me permission to buy kitchen gear intuitively for them. And they would then test me. <laughs> so like, oh, had we just been talking about what she sent us? <laughs> so, so funny. Is that a hoot? No, it's mm -hmm. really a true story. They have an amazing kitchen. They have, I mean, I have like two pots. They have an amazing kitchen. So um, oh, you nice. just have to relate to people. You know, this stuff's not magic, but it's fun. Sure. And <laughs> you have to use it with different people yeah. the way that makes them comfortable. Well, I'm going to test you now. So what is it that I need to hear about 
you know, going forward with my mission, my journey, what it is that I need to hear from you. Do you have a book yet? Do I have a book yet? No. Have you written a book? That's what comes next. I can probably line you up with a publisher or at least somebody to talk to for a publisher. Just saying. All right. <laughs> I don't even know. Like you're the fourth person that has told me that I'm writing, like I'm writing a book. I had one lady tell me that I'm writing a trilogy. I've had. You know, I don't I, see a trilogy. Don't worry about a trilogy. They just keep <laughs> telling yet. They keep saying you're going to write a book. I'm like, I don't know. You know, what am I going to write a book about? Uh, consciousness, you know, the truth, what it is, how it feels, throwing a few funny stories in there too. Um, I, I, I just see a book. All right. So that's next. It's not that hard. I see yellow energy because I always see colors. I actually put this yellow shirt on because I was hearing Trey needs yellow. So just saying I do have many different colored shirts. So I have those besides yellow, but yellow has to do with structure, believing in yourself, self-esteem, personal power. It's that it's that book stuff. I think it's like I think it's like take a take a take a risk, you know, mm -hmm. on a book. I can send you proposals. I can send you whatever I've done books. So I can send you like, you know what I mean? Samples of what to do and how to do it. Um, I, that's the picture I get. Do you want me to give you a couple more pictures? Yeah, keep okay. on coming. Let's go. All right. Then I get this image of you. You're wearing a blue shirt. The colors that we wear, it's not, doesn't mean you need to go do this speaking gig in a blue shirt. There's a meaning to the colors in my world. Like I have a very colorful symbolic world. I see you in this blue shirt. You look a little nervous, to be honest. You're, I don't know what this means, but you're in front of a group and I feel like there's two groups. This make, this is how the future works for me. I don't know what it, how it all makes sense. So I think you're speaking to half the group and somebody else is speaking to half the group. And then you're reversing and you get that other half of the group. There's some, something behind that, but I don't know what, maybe it's employers and then the employees, but there's like a natural breakdown, right? So you got to subdivide the people. But it's a pretty darn big group, you know, and I'm seeing you like you're you're nervous and you're laughing and you are holding up your book and you're going, it would really help me out if you would buy this book, too. <laughs> so it is speaking about the book. Well, it's speaking. The book is just a very small calling card mm -hmm. with the bigger messages that you're you've already accumulated. I hear the word accumulation, accumulated, cumulative sort of curriculum, but don't, but you're not a preachy sort of guy. You know what I mean? So it's not like a formal curriculum. And there's something in here, a guide is saying like, like it's, it's like, you want to stay away from that, you know, kind of, kind of gagging kind of the four secrets to life or the five steps to this, but you want to incorporate the idea of that also too. So mm. that's what I'm seeing next. It's interesting. Anything with the podcast? It's going places. It's already going places. There's a, does it ever get, do podcasts these days ever get like, um, like syndicated or brought to a, a bigger, you know, place or station? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what I see. I don't know the right word license syndicated. I don't know the N word. Anymore. Well, a lot of shows now are going to like Spotify, right? Like yeah, Joe, yeah, yeah, Joe yeah. Rogan uh -huh. with the Spotify, you got, right. um, that's Oops. probably what I'm seeing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Because like, that's the thing for podcasts now. It's like uh, memberships, right? Based like their membership. I know based. subscriptions, memberships, yeah. this and that. Yeah. So that's kind of probably what I'm seeing is it takes like a jump like that too. It feels like you need, um, I don't know, like you need to get on a couple of people's others podcasts, you know, their shows. And then that pulls your podcast forward too, mm. is what it feels like to me. Mm. what's the title of my book i know you got it <laughs> <laughs> let me see it i see you holding up your book and the there's a spin on the word success but it's also using a blend of the word success and consciousness you got to coin a phrase it's coined it's a phrase that you coin is what it is i'll pop it out i'll let you know when i get it it'll pop in Sure. I just think it's interesting. Like this is like, cause people have said you have a book in you, right? Like, and I'm just like, oh, okay. You, you know, here's the best way to approach doing a book. Don't think the book's in you. Right. I mean, it is in your soul. It's in your spirit. Like it's in your heart space, mm -hmm. 
you know, think of it more as there's a book coming through you. It's a lot easier. But I mean, like, do people just say that though? Like, I, I, I feel like, and don't take this wrong. Some way. people like, do. Like some I people. I think some people do. I do. Like, do. I see your book though. I can see your book. But a part of me is like, like, what would I write about? I don't even know what I would write about. And then it's like another part of me is like, yeah, book. It's awesome. Yeah, let's go. You know, let's get fired <laughs> up and do a book tour and do all this fancy I, stuff. Nobody does book does. tours anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you just crushed my dream. Um, <laughs> We're all sitting at home. <laughs> <laughs> but then it's just like but you do speaking engagements. <laughs> but, that, uh, but is it is it about consciousness though? It's like you it's know about I mean? consciousness. It's about consciousness, and it's about the stage that we're on, and it's about it's about like you can't wait until you can't wait for the stage light to, you know, to kind of like to be in the stage light. You can't wait for it to shine on you. You got to like sh start shining it out of yourself. That's the main thing. And then when you connect, are you, who are you connecting with? Like, are you connecting with your guides, my guides? What does that look like? Well, it's a million dollar question, isn't it? But um, <laughs> absolutely, I, I do this little practice that I actually had given to me in a dream. All right. Like I had learned so many different techniques, like studying here, studying here, learning this, learning that. And one night I had, you know, Jesus show up in my dream. And, you know, these days you're not even really supposed to use the word Jesus, but you know, whatever. So he showed up and he said, do you want to do this simpler? And I said, yeah. And he goes, do you want me to just show you how I did it? And I said, yeah. And, and so I packaged it in the best way I could copy it. So when I'm interfacing with anybody, I mean, I can just do this when I'm running the dogs in the morning too. Actually they're running, I'm walking, but I still do it. Um, you know, I firm my own spirit, which is the essence, which is my conscious spark, right? I affirm another's. So before I even go on, you know, something like this, you know, I connect with you, but, but that part of you that is who you really are. And then I affirm the guides, my guides, your guides, whoever shows up. I go to like presence source, and then I turn everything over to source. And what I tend to find, I knew we were going to talk about a book tonight. Isn't that really bizarre? Isn't that what? kind of fun? You, you knew we were going to talk about a book, your book, your book, <laughs> but I really wasn't psychically spying. I just had that feeling. So, um, that's why I was like looking at the books you had back there. And I'm like, are there any of those his, um, typically I believe that I talk to the person's guides because they know you. I don't know you, sure. they know you. And so that makes it kind of fun too, because the stage, you know, can kind of, the, the beings on the stage, the people on the stage kind of move around. Mm. So it's really, you know, it's really kind of more about that. Do they just but say, it, tell, they just tell them they, to stop being so fearful. Like They like they, you. <laughs> they they, like I you. hope, I hope. It's a great message, right? <laughs> Thank you. I hope you like me. Sometimes I get stuff that's really like, okay, good. <laughs> no, they already like you. They like you. I don't, I don't know if you're going to stop being scared like anytime really soon. I don't know if you need to, to be honest. Mm, and it's not so much scared. It's doubt. It's like, I'm the type of person that will, yeah, I will will stuff. myself to, right? Like I will myself to do so. Like, I will continue to do this. Yeah. That's I will. The yellow one. Energy. I like the en yellow energy, that yellow shirt. I love your paintings too in the background. Um, I will do whatever it takes. Like I get up and run too, right? Like because I know that it's the best way for me to become the most conscious yeah. receiving yeah. being yeah. that I can be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just the doubt that runs through my mind. It's like, man, you're. What yeah. You but doing? you know, doubt has a hidden side to it. Doubt's not all bad. There's a gem in doubt. And I don't really like the word humility, but there's a good side to the word humility. Like on the other side of doubt, you know, is humility, which is sort of that place of being open and receptive and being able to say, you know, I don't, I do doubt my abilities. I'm going to be better at this in five years. I'm going to be better at writing a book once I've written the first book, right? Because mm -hmm. you will be. So there's an honesty in it and a humility that I think can actually create receptivity too. Sure. And, and like there that. are structures in writing a book. Um, some, I used to teach a class a long time ago. I really liked it, signature styles. And I help people figure out 
their best style for writing or creating something. Cause if you try to do it somebody else's way, it's not going to happen very well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you yeah. know, there's people who time everything perfectly and people who have to have the creative muse. And I don't have a creative muse all that often, so I'd never get anything done. Um, so I think it's like finding your style and just doing it too. Sure. Some lady said uh, it's going to be written like how I talk. You know what I mean? Like that. And uh -huh. I, and I kind of do that already with like papers from yeah. college and stuff. Like yeah. when I go yeah. back to school, like I kind of write in the way that I speak, which is. Yeah. Do you have anybody like, interview you? Do you ever like just have somebody in? I tried to help a friend um, years ago. We were in Iceland, um, right? like a book proposal and actually we did really well but then she was too scared to do anything with it hmm. um you know and just interviewed her like okay so let's just talk about this let's just talk you know so i just took notes and kind of put things into you know kind of oh well so you're saying this could come next and then you would tell them this and then there's a whole outline just like that i sure. think i think that would work with you well cindy uh we we'll run up on time but i want you to come back on again um, I, I know you're a busy, busy lady, busy mom. Um, but I would love for you to be able to come back on and chat with us again, have a part two. I would love to do that. That would be terrific. You know, and if, if you want help pulling the outline out of you, I'm good at that. I mean it. <laughs> sure. How can people find you? How can they connect with you? It's su super simple. Cindydale.com spelled weird. C Y N D I Dale dot com everything's just on my website cindy i can't I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show wearing yellow and just giving me that inspiration yeah but i really do mean it i will help you pull an outline out like just to help hmm. i will so you sit with it and you know think about that i'm really good at it and i have fun at it <laughs> wait <laughs>